Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the House of the Lord, and I just want to extend a warm welcome to those who are watching us online who are not able to be here for whatever reason, but uh, you'll still receive the blessing from today as we open God's Word, and I trust that uh, truly may, God may fulfill that purpose in our hearts. And so we've addressed God already in prayer, but I just feel the need for another prayer so the Lord will, will bless with power this this message that will be um, spoken of today. Let's pray. Dear God, your word is alive today and your word is truth. Your word is comfort. And today in this troublous world that we live in, we pray that you may breathe life to this word. Bring us comfort and hope as we look to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. A day to be remembered. And uh, I think with a slide on its own, it gives away a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. Um, even though Flight 175 is not part of the, mess, part of the heading of the sermon, but uh, I think it uh, goes to show how inf influential this particular flight um, made history uh, in our world. So, you know... I don't think I need to mention that we're really living in troublous times. I think we're all uh, impacted to various degrees on the times that we're living in today that uh, it uh, really touches our lives one way or another. And uh, the fast changes and the constant updates of this and that technology and, and uh, just when you have the right update for COVID, you find another update. <laughs> and, and it just keeps changing all the time. Back in the 80s, I don't recall having this pace, but certainly today, um, a lot of people are finding it hard to keep up with that. But as we look to the future, we, many of us ask the question, what is really ahead of us? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But the signs of the times and how things are developing in this world is certainly pointing to something that is ahead that a lot of people are wondering and scratching their heads. What is, what is going to come next? And, uh, and I think that today, as we open this holy book, we can have certainty as to what that prediction may be. And so we're going to see today if, if we can see if what God is saying is on track to what we're seeing ar ar around us. And so we're going to have a look today on that, on that particular point. Now, what does that remind you of? Now, there's hundreds of pictures on the internet regarding this event. And, uh, and I think that it's still vivid in many people's minds, this awful scene that took place, obviously, um, in 2001. But it just goes to show, um, you know, when we ask the question, where were you that day? Have you been asked that question? Where were you that day? What were you doing that day when this happened? And uh, I remember actually very, very vividly where I was. Uh, believe it or not, I was actually uh, just coming out of a Bible study at church and we were studying the book of Hebrews. <laughs> I don't know what, if there's any, uh, any, anything to that, but it's just a coincidence. And it's incredible. When I turn that on, a lot of people say to me, oh, it feels like I was watching a movie. But uh, it was real. And this picture, certainly, um, of one, Flight 175, which uh, at 9 a.m. Uh, took off, heavily fueled, bound for LA, crashed nose first into the Southern Facade of the South Tower of World Trade Center, striking through floors 77 and 85, and with the youngest person aged two and a half on board, and the oldest, 82. So, big age range there. So, it's catastrophic to see just these images and until uh, and today, it's, there's, there's a register of about 2,000, almost 3,000 lives that were lost, both on the buildings and on the ground. And not to mention the psychological and physical impact of that day. 
And I'm sure you would have heard stories of people writing on the internet uh, how they were impacted to a degree or not. And then you have the ones that tell the story of how they something happened that diverted their way to not go to these towers and uh, they survived this tragedy. But, um, you know, I was working at Sydney International Airport at that time and I remember when this happened, not too far after that time, I started, we started receiving information about how the rules change within the airport. And I'm sure we could, we could still see that today. And, uh, you know, about sharps and liquids and this and that and how many more questions you need to ask to make sure that people didn't carry these things or they would lose them at security checkpoint. And, uh, and that brought in another element to my work that was already stressful enough. So it just goes to show how things change quickly around the world with something like this. And, uh, and you will recall how people used to have the opportunity to enter cockpits, you know, when the pilots used to allow, allow people to come in and visit. Well, this changed the whole thing. You're not allowed to go in a cockpit anymore. It's securely locked. And if you need permission, you have to be a crew member to go in. So a lot of things change, and I'm sure you can add to the list as to uh, how this thing has, has uh, impacted um, our way of life, you know, um, our uh, security, our safety, etc. And so we can certainly be discussing this the whole day. But, you know, that youngest traveller, two and a half year old that I was talking to you about, her name was Christine Lee Hansen, who was on vacation trip with her parents going to LA. And uh, it is just heartbreaking to see these stories like this because it's not only until you see the face of the child that it just really breaks your heart that someone like this could be part of this tragedy. And even though we do not understand everything that goes on in this life, one day we will have answers to these things. But certainly Christine, um, she was part of that flight, Flight 175, which is uh, terrible. And of course, not to mention the effects and after effects of a global pandemic. Have you heard about pandemic? And um, I'm sure you're not wearing masks here to look more pretty. But certainly we're in the middle of it. Two years and counting. And yet, we're still experiencing the effects of that, aren't we? To many degrees. And not to mention, of course, the word lockdown now has become very generic. And uh, I recall, you know, and I'm sure you do too, when at the time when everything just happened so quickly, where everything was shut down and all of a sudden you had to be at home and you couldn't go out, apart from essentials. You know about that? And uh, it was a shock for many people. Not being able to do this, not being able to do that, you had to stay at home. And it was all the unknown as to what can come next the very next day. And uh, a lot of people, you know, messaging social media went wild, as you all know. But the changes brought on mental health, jobs, families, freedoms, political and social unrest, and the list goes on. And it doesn't really matter which side of the argument you are on, and that's not what we're going to discuss today. But the question lies is, has this pandemic made you weaker or stronger? Especially in our faith. Has it made it more struggling in your faith? Or have you gone closer to the Lord as a result of it? Because God has an, had an intention towards that. You alone can answer that question. But in reality, the question is there. Has it made you stronger? Has it made you weaker? What have you learned about your faith in God during that time? And I'm sure you've done a lot of soul searching. And when everyone was locked up at home, it was probably the best time to get on to this and start talking with God more. Because as you all know, before the pandemic, this world was like 
so fast paced. Everything happens so quickly. You were here today, next day you're on the other side of the world. But I think God had to bring something to a slowdown so he can catch our attention. And so, how's that going for you today with your faith? Lockdown. Of course, after two weeks that we've been away from church, we're still feeling those effects, aren't we? And yet, we find that the prophetic clock is still ticking. This Bible has a lot to reveal about what's happening in this world. And yet, the prophetic clock is ticking, forever ticking. And as we know it, this world is wearing out like an old garment that needs to be replaced. And every day, God is giving us that precious time to know Him and to prepare for what is ahead. You know, Jesus um, spoke a lot about last day events, as you all know. But He's also pointing to past events to remind us of what's going ahead, what's happening ahead. And we find here in Luke 17, 26, 28 and 30, the following. As it was in the days of Noah, you all know this, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now, you must have read that hundreds of times. But what I've highlighted is Jesus' emphasis here. As it was, so it will be. As it was, so it will be. There's, do you see the certainty there? As it was, it's going to happen. And obviously, this event is pouring, pointing to the worldwide flood and Tons of evidence of that around the world that this actually took place. There's no question about that. But Jesus is reminding us of that. And certainly, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, even so it will be in the day of the Son of Man. So he's, he's referring to his second coming, but he's saying, just like those events took place like that, similar things will be happening before I come back. And the certainty is there is that when you read it for yourself, you're saying, okay, Jesus is really trying to tell me something here. He's really trying to tell me that those events, as we see them around us today again, I'm not saying there will be another worldwide flood, but how they lived back then was certainly an indicator of what society is going to look like before he comes back. And we could be talking a lot about the detail, but these are signposts. Signposts that you look out for. You know, when you're going on a trip, you start looking for signposts, and as soon as you see one, say, you, you know, I'm close to home. You know, whenever I come back and I'm starting to drive through David Edgeworth Avenue, I know I'm close to home. You see these door, um, signposts around us. And so, can things happen quickly, unexpectedly, with very little notice? Well, We've discussed just a moment ago about the pandemic, how we all got, got closed up so quickly. But things can happen suddenly. And I'm sure you can share something today about how that happens. But today, um, I just want to share these scriptures. Very wise man, um, Solomon. For man also does not know his time. Do you know when your time will be? We don't know. Like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time. Watch this. When it falls, how? Suddenly upon them. It's interesting, the reading there, because it says even though we don't know the time, and it gives the analogy of fish and birds, but it happens to mankind too. Things just happen so quickly and you sometimes with no reaction. And, and I'm thinking, what event happened just recently, fresh off the press, that could depict what Solomon is saying here? And I could not help to think about this that um, took place in Brazil. Do you know what happened there in Brazil just not long ago? Where these people were boat riding and they're having a nice time. And all of a sudden, this slab just falls and collapses, killing six people and 32 injured. 
And I saw the video and it was just like that. The people that were just underneath that slab had no little reaction to just get out of there. This just fell on them. That's what this, this text is saying. It just comes upon man without even knowing. That's how fragile life is when you least expect it. It happens when you don't know. And there's many other ones that probably don't come to light in the media. But this is a classic example of that text that we just read. As tragic as that is, but it does it not speak of reality? It certainly does speak of that reality of Ecclesiastes. Rapid movements will come. Listen to this, Testimonies of Church 9-11. <laughs> Great changes are soon to take place in our world. And the final movements will be, finish it off, will be rapid ones. You know, Jesus gives the analogy of birth pangs in Matthew 24. For those women who have given birth, you know what I'm talking about. And birth pangs get quicker and stronger as you get closer to the delivery. Correct? And as Jesus is pointing to all these signs are like equivalent to birth pangs, and he says, when you see this happening, then that means there's, there's a, a, a critical event that follows immediately after that. But the changes that are happening around us, I mean, can we safely say that this is describing society today? We can certainly say that. But there will be rapid ones. We are told that by inspiration. 9-11, I don't know sure if that's got anything to do with, um, with the date of, uh, of the uh, Twin Towers, but certainly the message is, in, is amazing. Now, church attenders due to a crisis. You know, it's, it's amazing what things happen in a church when there's a crisis. And I'm not talking about a crisis in the church, that too, but a crisis out there that impacts people inside the church. Yeah, this is a picture of a packed church. And I'm sure you would have read of articles of people going, just flocking to churches after 9-11. Or any crisis. Now, we couldn't do that during the pandemic because we couldn't come to church. But I'm sure if it was a major crisis, everyone would be here. If we're allowed to. But the rapid church attendance in the United States after 9-11 was significant. And obviously, while we do not have the capacity to judge motive as to why people go to church due to a crisis, only God can do that. But it just sort of like makes you wonder, what's the actual reason as to why they all of a sudden come back to church? And, uh, and there's different surveys on this, and I'm going to share two with you with it, just to have an idea of what happened at that time immediately after the Twin Towers. Now, this is uh, drawn from... Um, do today. After 9-11, a short-lived rush to church. And uh, after September 11 terror attacks, many expected American houses of worship to be jammed with parishioners seeking refuge, community, and a place to greet. That's fine. And that spike in church attendance did in fact occur briefly, just briefly. But the attacks do not have a lasting effect on American religiosity, says Mark Chaves, a Duke professor of sociology, religious studies and, div uh, uh, and divinity. Chaves directs a national congrega uh, con congregation studies which examines American religious places of worship over time. He says that the jolt to church attendance following the attacks lasted just a few weeks. Can you see that? People thought this type of crisis of national significance would lead people to be more religious, and it did, he says, but it was very short-lived. There was a blimp in church attendance, and then it went back to normal. As I said before, we, we, we couldn't measure this as we're in the middle of a pandemic because we, we couldn't come here. Religious, religion in the aftermath of September 11, this was um, just close to that time. And here they're asking a question as to 
I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in reality, the poll is suggesting uh, what was people's attendance during normal church before September 11? And a lot of people did, in fact, say for, for the last, you know, for every, the, every week that went by, they did actually attend church. But the statistics there were saying that when they asked the question, um, did you yourself happen to ch- uh, attend the church or synagogue in the last seven days? No lasting change. Over the last decade, the responses to the question have averaged right on about 40% with the usual fluctuation that occurs from survey to survey. The last time we asked the person before September 11 was in May when 41% of Americans replied that had gone to church synagogue in the, within the last seven days. Right after the attacks in September 2021 survey, 21-22 survey, the percentage moved up to 47 Now, you might not think that 41 to 47 is not a lot, but in the United States, that's a lot of people. Six or seven percent, that's a lot of people. But the two subsequent surveys in early November and the past weekend, which was December 14 to 16, the percentage went back to 42 to 41. In other words, church attendance, as measured by the question has settled right back down to where it was. What's happened? Why? <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, when it comes to these type of things, and the reason why we're bringing out in this message is because we need to examine our own hearts. We need to see what's inside there, what steers it, what moves it. And it's a time for reflection. And the Lord is is someone who invites us and he says, let's reason together. Let's talk about it. Let's have a look. But the reality is reflected there. It's not something that we're creating. It's there. And so it just goes course to action as to what do we do about these things? And certainly the Lord today is calling on his people as we see times and things unfolding before us. And two things I'm going to talk about today is a call to watch and be ready, as we're in the scripture reading, watch and be ready, and a call to know God in an intimate relationship. These two things, if we miss these two things, then we are not on the right track. We need to have a look at these two things more, care, more closely. Okay, let's look at the first one. A call to watch and be ready. Matthew 22, verse 44, which my daughter read. Therefore you also, what? Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Suddenly, it will come. Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 989, reads the following. When probation ends, it will come. How? Suddenly. Now, for those who do not understand this word probation, it's simply meaning, can mean two things. It can mean probation for entire humanity or it can be the probation of your own life when we close our eyes in death. That's when probation closes for us as individuals or just before Jesus comes, it'll be a probation ending for the entire world. But probation, when probation ends, it will come suddenly, unexpectedly. <laughs> wow. Unexpectedly, as, it, as a time when we are least expecting it. Not my words. And this is the comfort. But we can have a clean record in heaven. When? Today. What a beautiful text. It describes the reality of things. Yes, a probation. But today, today, we can have a clean record in heaven. Isn't that the longing of the human heart to be right with God? That's the longing, the deepest longing of humanity, and yet a lot of people don't know that, that there's a God out there that wants a personal, intimate relationship with them. We can have a clean record today and know that He accepts us. That's the gospel, that He's waiting for us with open arms. And we can have that assurance today that we can have a clean record in heaven today. So what does that call for? It calls 
for us to make things right with God. And certainly, the Lord challenges us on, on the, uh, us on that today. Now, be ready or get ready. Is there a difference? Because Jesus, you know, sometimes when you look, look at Scripture, you've got to look at it carefully because sometimes you can misinterpret what Jesus is saying here. Be ready or get ready. Now, I'm going to give you an analogy to see if you can understand this. Suppose I'm taking a trip from A to B, right? Most of us here are trust. You've been traveling at least somewhere or overseas. You go, let's, let's just say that I'm, I'm standing on A. My, my trip is about to take place in B, right? That's four weeks away. And so... I start to plan. Week one, I'm gonna, I got this. I got my list, I got this. Week two, I'm gonna do this. Week three, I'm gonna do this. And week four, I'm gonna do this. So you got it all nicely laid out. So you are getting ready, right? You are getting ready. Now, suppose that for some odd reason, this is only an illustration, that they call you up and they say that the trip has been brought forward by two weeks. What's happened to your planning? It's all of a sudden cut short, right? It's cut short. And those things that you had planned for week three and four, what's happened to that? It's caught you by surprise, unexpectedly. And there goes your planning. And that's what we call is getting ready, which is not what Jesus is saying. Getting ready is precisely that. Now, to be ready is this is that I get a call that my, my trip takes place only in two weeks, but by week one, I was already ready. I had everything in place. And it didn't cut me by surprise. Does it make sense? You've got everything in order, and you're ready to go. Even if it was brought forward to week one, you're ready to go. That's what Jesus is saying. And it does not mean to delay things, delay decisions that you could have made before. Why? Because things happen, come on folks, suddenly and quickly. We have no control of certain things. But we can control certain things and those are decisions that we can make today as we have read before. And so that's what it means and that's what Jesus is saying is to be ready. And it's incredible how a little word can change the meaning, isn't it? Because we could be getting ready but how can we be sure? But if, if he accepts us and we have a relationship with him, it certainly makes a difference. So we know the Bible tells us, and Jesus himself said that, he's going to come as a thief in the night. And that simply means that he's going to come to the one who's unprepared as a thief. But for the one who is prepared, he's not a thief because you're waiting there. And so that's why it's so important to hear what he says. You know, there's an ana analogy that, uh, that we could also use from scriptures. And, oh, by the way, so week one, that's when it means that I am ready as opposed to getting ready. You know, the story of, um, of Gideon, Judges chapter 7, verse 6 and 7, you can read the whole thing. But in reality, do you remember when they were going to go out to war? And God told them that there were too many because if they won in the war the children of Israel, they were going to claim glory to themselves and not to God. And so God told Gideon, now you need to cut back on your army. It's, there's too many of you. Plus, by the way, there's a lot of people in your army who are scared. If, if you send them out to battle, they'll probably run away. And so he's, asking, he's telling them to cut back. And so we pick up the story here and he gives them a test and the test is there in that, in that picture and what was that test? That God told them how to drink, to drink the water, but at how they drank the water made the difference. And so some of them actually lapped, as it says here, and the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Why would this test make a difference between those who are going to go continue in war as opposed to those who are not going to continue? <laughs> you, 
you know, sometimes God has a sense of humor sometimes. And so why would you use a test like this to, um, to distinguish between those who are going to battle and those who won't? And I, was, and I was thinking to myself, okay, it's interesting how the, the picture itself gives it away. The man who's lapping and drinking water with his hand, what is he doing? What's he doing? He's looking at his objective. And what's the objective? The battle. It was not about the drinking water. It was about keeping focus on what was ahead of him. Whereas the others lost that focus and looked down to drink water. That means they were not really thinking about the battle. And God told them. And the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you. Where is our focus today, folks? Is our focus down when we're about to enter into a battle? Or is our focus ahead because we know about the battle? And obviously, we're using spiritual terms here. Every day when you get up, are you lapping? Or are you trying to drink water like these men did? I'm not talking about physically, of course. Your attitude towards how you approach your day with God makes a big difference. Are we careless or we are really serious about following God? So our preparedness does matter and where our focus is today will determine our future. Simple, isn't it? Our choice, what the, you know, God is sovereign. He gives you the choice. You make the choice. But he tells us what our con- the consequences are of our choices. And he invites us to make the right choice today. This event here. Jesus said these words almost 2,000 years ago. And as a church, we've been proclaiming it with a loud voice at least for over 150 years. And every time we hear about it or we see it, people react differently about this event. And I know, I know that many of you are wary This world has taxed you a lot. That you are longing for this to happen. And the trials are getting harder and harder. And you wonder, is this really going to happen? Now, it's not about doubting what Jesus said. Because he said, I will come again. The problem is that A lot of people try to use that and fix it to their own little understanding. And so when it doesn't happen in in their, in their way, they get discouraged and turn away. But we've got to look at things God's way, from his perspective. And when we do that, we will have peace. You know, today we're singing about peace. That's wonderful. You chose those hymns because it's really about having that peace as we are waiting for this. And you sort of like wonder, why is the Lord delaying? And it's, an, it's only an apparent delay. It seems like that, but it's only apparent. And we, as we see more and more signs fulfilled, hey, it should get us more encouraged, right? And I think that we should not be like the evil servant saying, my, my Lord delayeth his coming. What a dreadful thought. And God wants us to just focus strongly on that, this event. And yet while we try to work out when this will happen, and I'm not talking about date setting, I'm talking about how the things that are around us happening and think how prophecy will just come to pass and will pinpoint exactly when he's coming. I think the most important thing is that we try to understand God a little bit more. Look at this statement from Desire of Ages, page 32. But like the stars in the vast circuit of the appointed path, 
These are creator words. God's purposes know no haste or delay. No haste or delay. It is a certain pace, isn't it? God is keeping with certain pace. And so we need to learn how to walk in that pace. I can understand why the revelator wrote in Revelation 14, here is the patience of the saints. And so it takes character to do that. It, it takes keeping up pace with the Lord. No haste, no delay. While these words were written in the context of his first coming, certainly in the, in the, in, in the context of his second coming, by all means, God will bring it to pass at the right time. <laughs> it may seem like a delay, folks, but it's not. He's coming on time. He's coming on time. And you say, well, God is still waiting for us. A call to know God in a personal relationship, point two. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, eternal living forever is not eternal life. It's part of eternal life. Eternal life in its essence, according to the words of Jesus in his own lips, is knowing God. That's eternal life. Living forever is just part of it. Don't associate that just you live forever, that um, that's eternal life. It's not. According to Jesus' words, eternal life starts now knowing God. For yourself. Knowing God for yourself. The sum and substance of the whole of Christian grace and experience is contained in believing on Christ, in knowing God and His Son whom He has sent. Amazing Grace, page 2324. The whole substance, when you just wrap it up all in one, is to know God. Not about God, but know Him personally for yourself, contained in this marvellous book, which you grab day by day and start finding out who God is. And that's only something you can do for yourself. You know, even little babies, even though you give them, you feed them, they still need to chew and, and swallow, right? They need, still need to eat for themselves. So this is a personal experience. Nobody else can feed you that experience. You alone have to do that. And God has given you enough intelligence for you to do that. To pick up the word and say, Lord, what are you telling me today? Where are you guiding me? And not pretend. God takes it very seriously. You know, in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, do you remember to, to one group he says, I do not know you. Remember they come and start knocking, Lord, open the door for us. And he says, I don't know who you are. What's happened? I don't know who you are. And so in verse 13, the very next verse, he says, watch. Watch that that experience does not catch you by surprise because knowing me takes time. That's what God says. So we need to invest in an ongoing daily connection with God as he prepares us for these events that are happening around us. We can't be just looking at the events and not doing anything else. God wants us and he's very serious about really preparing ourselves as these things happen around us. Does it make sense? It's not just wasting time and getting caught up with everything. It's so easy to be get caught up. Somebody was talking about distraction today. And folks, sometimes we just need to switch off the TV and switch on. The best time that you can know about God is when you go onto Facebook every day. You go on Facebook? If you want to know more about God, go to Facebook. You're all looking at me weird. I'm not talking about the social media one. I'm talking about this one, Facebook. 
face the book. It's, it seems like it's a contradiction, right? They call it Facebook. But in reality, we need to face this book every day. And we need to know what the Lord says. And how can you know someone unless you're spending time with them? And you know, we know how life, how busy life can be, right? Very fast paced. But yet, the real fight of faith is to seek God early each day. Because you think that everything's going to be rosy on your day when it's not. There's a real battle for your soul, friends. The devil is very serious about playing for keeps for your soul. But the good news is that God is doing the same thing. He's playing for keeps for your soul too. And so there's a battle there. And, you, and I'm putting it in a format of a poem. Because <laughs> it, really, it, it really talks about our daily experience from day to day. See if you can find yourself in the poem. Someone whispers in my ear, the time is five o'clock, my dear. My mind awakes this early hour or must decide for sleep or power. To sleep means rest a little while, to pray means power to be stronger. Sorry, to sleep means rest a little longer, to pray means power to be stronger. The rest my weary body needs but need for power far exceeds. The tempter says, just pray in bed. No need to rise to me, he said. But when his method I have kept, I awake again to find I've slept. And then the blessing I have missed and sin is harder to resist. So rise I must if I would find the strength needed to be kind. The power only God can give a truly Christian life to live and He can give it best to me before the, the rising sun I see. We've got an example of that, don't we? For you may be another hour, but it's best from God to gain His power. But I've found from day to day if Christ-like, I intend to stay. I must rise when I first I hear that gentle whisper in my ear. That's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? And you might think, wow, it's just something so, how something so subtle can be so real. And you find out when it's too late in your day when the battle gets stronger. Because you did not invest at that time when God just called you. Come. Do we have an example of that in the Bible? Yes, we do. Mark chapter 1. Jesus rose up before the sun came up and he went to pray in a certain time because he, knew he needed it. As a son of man, he needed it. How much us who are vulnerable to the attacks of the devil. So the Lord is ever calling us, come, come. He's saying the invitation to everybody, come. You know, Job 22, verse 21, we'll close with this. Now acquaint yourself with, with him and be at, <laughs> uh, I think it was providence that we sung that word about peace. Be acquainted with Him and be at peace. That's the only way that it's going to happen. If you're longing for peace in your soul, you need to get acquainted with the Prince of Peace. And that's Jesus Christ. Thereby, good will come to you. What a wonderful text. Acquaint yourself. Friends, acquaintance takes time. Acquaintance takes time. You need to get to know the other person even though God may know everything about you, but you need to spend that time with Him. You know, our last day on earth will not be any different to our first day in heaven. 
Our last day on earth will not be any different to our last, to, sorry, the last day on earth will not be any different to our first day in heaven. And I'm not talking about a physical aspect, I'm talking about in the relational aspect because your relationship just carries on for eternity when the Lord comes. And it grows. Can you think of anyone in the Bible who experienced this? Enoch, right? He's, the Bible says he walked with him 300 years and then the Lord just took him and said, there's no need to stay down there anymore, just come up, we'll continue it up here. And his first day in heaven was no different to his last day on earth. You get it? The same thing for us. As we invest time with God and, he see, and when we see him face to face, what that's going to be like, you know, when we sing that song, face to face with Christ my Saviour. What that's going to be like, it's unimaginable. We cannot even picture it. But hey, you can start today and you can make that decision to embark in that journey with Christ. And that day that, we, that is to be remembered, which was a horrific day, can be an object lesson for us to be ready now because we do not know what tomorrow holds. Does anyone have a certificate of assurance today that what's going to happen to you tomorrow? No, no one has it. Because tomorrow is in God's hands. Today, He's giving you the blessing to accept Him and to make that relationship serious with Him. And so I just want to urge those who are watching too, if, if you've been hearing this message that's been touching your heart, please make that decision for Christ. And salvation is individual. God has children, not grandchildren. That experience must be yours. And so I pray that the message today may be speaking to you some way or another. The Holy Spirit has been touching your hearts to be ready, not to get ready, to be ready. So when He comes, it will be a glorious moment. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we pause just to say thank you. How are you, as a Father in heaven, you're always, always telling us the dangers that are in this life and just to separate from you is, uh, is dangerous enough. And so today, Lord, we, we just want to cement that relationship with you because we want eternity in our hearts today, right here, right now. And that when Jesus comes, as he said he will, that that will carry through the ceaseless ages of eternity. Bless everyone that is here, those who are watching online, that um, they make, make this, this decision, take it seriously. Because we know the time is short. Thank you for blessing us and for reminding us once again that you will come back and help us hold on to that assurance. This is our prayer in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.